Well, it's time for another value-packed episode of Evolved Sales Live. Welcome back. I'm Jonathan Fisher. Sales has changed a lot in recent years. Everyone's talking about digital selling, social media selling, and for good reason. But one thing hasn't changed. Phone-based business development is and will remain a critical element in any truly effective go-to-market strategy, especially when selling B2B. And today's guest is here to help us with that very thing. Leveraging over three decades of experience inside globally known corporations working in sales, business leadership, and organizational development, Paul Ledesma works today as a mentor, coach, and consultant to businesses all across the U.S. and beyond. His specialty is helping organizations sharpen mindset and improve frontline tactics to elevate their sales. And he's here today to help us improve seven critical skills on the phone. Paul Ledesma, great to have you on the show. Great to be here, Jonathan. Thank you for that introduction. Yeah, my pleasure. So, uh, hey, what what do you do every day in your consulting work, and how did you get into that kind of uh, of offering value to the marketplace? Great question. It's um, I've been in sales leadership, like you said, for better than three decades, and I've always believed that sales training is not going to be effective unless people reinforce it. Uh, there's a definite need for salespeople to have accountability. Uh, it's very easy for them to get into that squirrel mode, get into doing activities that are not going to be income producing activities. And what they need are strong leadership and strong accountability coaches to help them out. And so I've done that my entire career uh, as a sales leader. Uh, but what I'm finding is that now as a sales coach, working on that 100% full time, I'm enjoying my life. I no longer have to do reviews at the end of the year. I don't have to deal with HR. I just get to play with the kids and help them get better at what they do and send them on their way. And it's been a real great progression in my career to move from being in that executive leadership level into being an actual hands-on coach helping people succeed. I love it. You get to, get to do the fun part now. That's yeah, that's great. it. That's exactly right. So uh, in your work, obviously, frontline selling, I mean, we're developing a lot of business on the phone, trying to get those appointments in the calendar, trying to set up for uh, you know, solid, qualified, pre-qualified pipeline. Um, and you're seeing a lot of mistakes being made out there, no doubt. And I know you're going to share seven skill areas we can improve on. Uh, but just to kind of set it up a little bit, what are some, some of the most common mistakes that you see being made uh, in the phone selling game today? I would say some of the most common that I'm seeing being made are people are just burning and churning through data. Uh, they go through those leads super fast. They don't bother to leave a impactful message to get people to call them back. Uh, it's a waste of opportunity that I see happening quite a bit. I also see people that have a struggle with their mindset. We'll be talking about that quite a bit actually, because I'm finding mindset is being uh, overlooked uh, too much. I also see people not getting referrals, uh, even on, in a BDR's role, uh, you still have the opportunity to talk to somebody and see if there's somebody else that you could speak to. So I see that step being skipped nine times out of 10, uh, yeah. especially at that BDR level, maybe not at the tenured uh, reps level, but I think that they can still do a much better job in keeping their pipeline full. Well, those those sound like very common mistakes. Being made. Why do you think they're missing things, even including mindset and not getting referrals? I mean, some of that sounds fairly <laughs> rudimentary. What's the gap? The gap is habit. The gap is being able to develop skill set that will enable them to be successful. Uh, oftentimes, I find even tenured tenured people. I just got off the call with a, a group where most of the folks there were uh, twenty year loan originators. Uh, they've been in the business for a long time and they're just not bothering to prospect because they've gotten out of the habit. They've spent the last two years gathering uh, mm -hmm. because uh, the re refinance model was just there and they've let their skills of hunting atrophy and mm -hmm. uh, it's helping them get back to the basics and understanding how to develop those relationships with the people they need to develop them with. Hmm. Do, do you feel like there might be an opportunity for organizations? You know, I, I alluded in the intro to the movement over to digital. Everyone's giving that so much focus. I wonder if it's pretty common what you just alluded to, that people are getting off of the old school fundamental, whether it's pounding the pavement or working <laughs> those phones. Do you think that might be an opportunity for certain companies? 100%. A matter of fact, I just mentioned that call I was on. Uh, one of the things that was interesting was I called this uh, manager and 
introduced myself a little bit over a month ago. And he says, oh, my goodness, somebody's actually calling me on the phone. <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> I, 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 he was shocked and he's in charge of salespeople. Wow. And that was something that he just shared with me was that, you know, we get constant texts, we get constant LinkedIn blurbs that sort of the verbal vomit of everything that they're going to do for me. Mm. But that human connection, that human touch through a phone or through something like we're doing right now where we're seeing each other face to face, uh, that's definitely needed by mm. people. And that's the type of touch they do want to continue to have. Mm. Uh, everything else is just becoming noise. And what was the title of that person, by the way? He was a branch manager for a, a loan origination company. Okay, even a branch manager level. Yeah. I saw some recent Gartner yeah. research that the higher up the chain you go, the more critical that phone piece is, the more they want to be talked to over the phone and interacted with at a personal level. Um, and even just across the board, B2B selling, over 51% of those uh, polled do prefer a phone interaction before going to the next step in the sales funnel. So it's definitely a, a huge thing. So um, as you're working with your clients and helping them improve their game with their teams, uh, we've already set it up for seven skill areas. So <laughs> let's jump in. Let's let's hit it with like number one. Uh, and you, you said mindset was big. Is that kind of your first key then? That is my first number one key. Um, I think it really comes down to that they really don't have a fully baked plan when they start in on calling people. And mm. the first and most important part is mindset. Uh, mm. Remember, you have been hired to represent a company, a product, and a brand. The first thing you have to do is intentionally find your own why. Why are you doing this? What benefit are you trying to share with customers? What is it that you believe in about your product? Uh, for instance, I'm a thousand percent bought into the belief that sales training doesn't stick without reinforcement and accountability. Mm. Therefore, that's why I've chosen to be a coach. And I, I believe this for decades. So when I contact people, I come in with the passion, with the, with the mindset that this is something people need. Your why may be different. It could be a personal motivation, but I find an aligned motivation is going to come through with conviction. Hmm. Uh, if you're dialing without conviction, it's just going to sound hollow. So hmm. as a BDR, as somebody who's making these dials, there has to be a formidable reason for you to make that call that you believe in. And hmm. you, uh, that needs to be found first. That is going hmm. to make a world of difference in how you approach people. Hmm. Yeah, if, if you don't have uh, a real important uh, reason why you're doing the activity, especially when it's grunt work, I mean, it is a grind, right? When you're talking, yeah. working the phones, you know, you're you're gonna you're gonna make contact with twenty some percent. You're gonna two percent are gonna turn into something you can put in your pipeline. It, it takes a lot of motivation, so it's really good what you're talking about. What what are some examples of effective whys? Effective whys, uh, for instance, uh, working with some life insurance agents. Uh, I have found that I've really had to delve deep and say, why are you doing this? Why not something else? And it's because they say, once we get to, because I can help people change their lives and change their legacy. Those are the whys we're looking for, because this is something that is going to be life changing for those people. If you're talking about uh, so SAS software and you've got something that's going to work in the medical field, well, why is that so important to you? Hmm. Well, it's, becoming, it's going to streamline the business for everyone that touches it. Mm -hmm. And that is going, and I have worked in a situation where we didn't have streamlined processes. And I feel confident that I've got a product that is going to do that for this company. Hmm. Those are the types of whys. You really be connected to what you're doing and why you're doing it. If you can do that, you're on, you're on your way to having effective communication. Sounds like there's some homework for some leadership on the uh, that's listening to the show, you know, to really, really connect those dots. What is our organizational mission and not some cheesy slogan and not right. even a selfish uh, motive. But, you know, what do we really do? I mean, at the end of the day, when you're offering value to the marketplace, that's touching people. And we've said that in other episodes of our program here that that actually has a lot of value beyond the mere transaction. A lot of value beyond the mere dollars changing hands. There's, you're actually solving problems. So I, I love that you, you bring that to the fore. Um, another key that you mentioned in your training is scripting. Now, that could be a controversial topic. I've talked to a lot of people in sales leadership. 
And there's definitely a wide range of opinions from those who love them, and I wanted every word, and I'm going to monitor that to a T, to those who like the script, forget about it. Um, where do you come down? Like, how do you even define script, and, and uh, how does it play a role? How is that important? Well, I, and I have to admit, I was one of those sales guys that I, I don't need to be scripted. I can just wing it. I'm going to be able to hear what they say and respond to it in, in kind. But over the years, I've discovered one thing. Scripting is the highest form of communication. Hmm. It is done with a purpose. You are writing out words and thoughts and plans with a purpose to share with your clientele. And the more you get that ingrained into who you are and what you do, it becomes much easier for you to share the salient points for whatever customer you're listening to and hearing what their needs, pain points, what those are, to be able to utilize a script or even a story to be able to illustrate why what you're sharing with them is important and relevant to what they do. Uh, the one thing I would say about uh, scripting is most salespeople do resist it. Uh, mm. they, 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 the, because the words are not theirs. And mm. I understand that completely. But as you review a script that you have, what can you do to make it your own? What can you take from those words that were written by somebody else and say, well, why is that? Why is this phrase in there? What does it mean? And why would it be relevant to the customer? and find ways to make it your own. Uh, oftentimes people try a script half-heartedly, it fails, and then they blame the script. Eh, that script doesn't work. Hmm. But if that's the case, <laughs> return to step one, which is mindset, and figure out what your why is and incorporate that into your script. Hmm. Uh, so what I would tell all leaders is before asking uh, BDRs, SDRs to pick up a phone, build a script and then help them make it their own, help them make it sound, uh, make it sincere, not sound sincere, I almost made a mistake, but make it sincere so that mm -hmm. they are sharing information that is uh, believable to themselves and things that they would like to share with others. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like you're, you're not asking for folks to literally memorize it the way you would recite a poem, for example, but you, it's more of a guide, maybe something akin to an actor who has to you know, make it make it her own personality. It kind of brought out through the character she's portraying. Is it something a little bit more like that? I would agree. I would agree. It's more like that. I would agree that people starting off with the script uh, who haven't had any experience should go through the script and learn what nuances they need to put on it to initially make it sound better to themselves. But as time progresses, keep honing that script and keep making sure that script becomes part and parcel of what you are sharing. We don't want everyone to become robots, but your scripts mm -hmm. are going to be, can be broken down into pieces. And as you hear and want to respond to customers, you can take out certain pieces of that script and utilize them uh, in that moment. And that's where the scripting becomes really important is that you have your go-to understandings, acknowledgements of the customer, and then your response. So why can't you do it without a script? Like, why can't you just cut your salespeople loose and let them have conversations and make things happen? What's wrong with that? I think the problem with not having a script, not having your pieces in your ducks in a row is that you will tend to get off track. Uh, you will tend to go down the rabbit hole with the customer while, and not be able to stay on point, not mm. to be able to stay on message. Uh, I find sometimes customers will, will just string you along and take you someplace where you weren't intending to go. And it's really important to keep the momentum moving forward in the conversation so that you can properly respond and showcase your product, but at the same time, earnestly listen to your customer and be able to uh, take what their concerns are and remedy those concerns through your, through your scripting. That's awesome. So um, you talk a lot about <laughs> the importance of voicemail, and that's another one where I, the, you're going to get a variety of opinions. Is it even worth it to do it, or <laughs> you do it after the first call versus the second or third call, or what do you say? So give us your insights on the voicemail game. This is something that's a really amazing, and I've talked to a lot of sales professionals over the years. You'll see people who never leave a voice message. 
uh, because they don't think that people respond. You'll have other people say, I get 70% of my voicemails returned. Hmm. And I'm probably on the second half. I'm between 50 and 70% getting my voice messages returned. Hmm. Uh, simple steps to take. First call you, you make to that client. And if uh, it goes to voicemail, I don't leave a message. That indicates it's not a good time of day to give a call. Hmm. Uh, but then I choose another time of day and make that call. And I leave a mystery message. It's very simple. Uh, basically, I just share with people, hey, uh, my name is Paul. I've gotten pointed in your direction as somebody I should talk to. Um, I have a couple of questions I could use your help on. If you could, give me a call back. Here's my phone number. And with that, I get a good 50% of my calls back. I didn't mention my last name. I didn't mention what company I was with. I was honest with them. <laughs> I do. I was pointed in their direction, and I do have questions in order to find out if what I can do for them is, is something in alignment with what they need. Mm -hmm. uh, but by keeping it simple, by keeping that message simple, uh, people have an intrinsic desire to help others. And by sharing that little simple message, uh, it becomes a very easy way to get people to call you back. And if you have a referral, uh, if somebody referred you to that person, it's perfectly fine. Hey, my name is Paul. Uh, George said I should talk to you. I have a couple of questions wondering if you could help me out. I can be reached at. And those calls come back quite frequently. Um, and it's better than churning and burning through the, the data because uh, leads are finite. Uh, mm. the quality leads are even harder to come by. So make sure to make every opportunity to make a contact with somebody and engage them because that's where the real work begins. Well, if you're getting a, you know, a 2% response versus 52 <laughs> or more response rate, that, 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 that definitely makes it more worthwhile to take those extra few moments and leave a voicemail. I like that a lot. So Absolutely. you also talk about once you get someone on the line, the way that you approach that conversation <laughs> uh, is really critical. Talk to us about the, the approach. Like, what do you mean by that and how do we implement? Well, quite frankly, I'm talking to somebody. They don't know who I am and we're just getting to break the ice. So uh, what I want to do first is to create an interruption, a, a thought interruption, uh, because they're trying to figure out how to respond to somebody they're talking to that they're unfamiliar with. So my simple approach is, is, is pretty fun. It just says, uh, hi, George, this is Paul. And I pause. At Paul Ledesma, and I say with a big smile on my face, <laughs> if you're trying to place a face to the name, it's okay if you can't. We haven't actually met, but we do have a mutual connection. And that's when I bring up the ref the person who referred me or the, the business entity that, that we're talking about. This is where you can bring up that person and the common business interest and lighten the load. Nine times out of 10, people smile, they laugh, uh, they get it that, that there was this tension where I was trying to figure out who you were, but it's okay. Mm -hmm. And it really opens up the conversation to the next step, which is really getting involved into sharing with who you are and what you're about. That's cool. Is there a, a broader approach you can use if you're just, you know, maybe you, you like it, you could curate a list. I could see doing that of, of contacts that where you have some kind of connection you can refer to. What if you're just, you know, you're that SDR, you're churning through numbers and all you have is their name and their company is flashed on your screen. Uh, do you have a stock way that you could still make that work with integrity? I think the way you would make that work with integrity is bring up the fact that you are working with other people in that industry. Mm. You know, you don't know me for Adam, but I've been working with Fred at this company and Jeff at this company. And sure. the, common the common interest is that we're all in this business. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm with my company. Can I uh, have you heard of us? And it, again, it brings up that letting people know that you are there with a purpose and that you're going, you are working with others in that profession and that, it, that you are intent on working with them as well. Yeah, that makes sense. Like, and I think, you know, as a sales leader, uh, you could curate your list and, and even have like, and, hey, in this vertical, there's here's some accounts that we have or that we're working on that would say something to this group of, of, uh, of contacts and so forth and really make that make sense so that there's actual integrity behind that. Cause that's, I think that's really key. I'm sure you would agree. Um, Absolutely. So in that approach, which that does, the way you just modeled that, that does sound really friendly. You probably would get me to listen to the next thing. That's great. Um, there's something else you mentioned about the phrasing and uh, the, something you should do every time you, you make a statement mm. on the phone. What, what was that? 
Well, the statement with the phone is, hey, my name is Paul. I am with XYZ Company. Uh, have you heard of us? I end everything I do with a question. Mm -hmm. uh, that is extremely important because, again, it's a thought disruptor. Uh, they may be thinking of ways to get off the phone, but as soon as I ask, have you heard of us, they're just going to respond, no, I haven't. And then I say, no worries. Let me share a little bit about what we do. And if it's something of interest, great. If not, a big deal. Uh, if not, no big deal. We'll, we'll just uh, shake hands and move forward. Is Would that be okay? It's a very mm -hmm. friendly, non-threatening uh, approach. If, if, if something of interest, great. If not, no big deal. Uh, and then I share with them what we do. At XYZ, we do this. And for instance, this other company, we supported them by streamlining, uh, streamlining one of their activities, resulting in a 25% increase in productivity. Hmm. What is your team currently working on to improve that aspect of their business? Again, ending with the question, mm -hmm. I just shared how I was able to increase uh, productivity by 25% with another client. But then I just say, I don't say, does that sound good to you? <laughs> I don't uh, right. with a yes or no question. I don't mm -hmm. end it with hoping that they say, well, that's great. I just end it with what is your team currently working on in order to improve that aspect of your business? Yeah, that's good. One of our listeners actually had anticipated said open-ended questions. So yes. that is good, right? The more you're getting them to talk, the more the guard should be going down, right? You're, you're Now you're in, in more of an actual conversation. I really like that. So ending with a question is important. Someone says, well, why is that? And I say, well, why not? <laughs> but, uh, Love it. Yeah, so you want, it's, it's great to have questions throughout. And then um, you mentioned the importance of using storytelling as well. Um, talk to us about that, why that matters, and give us some of the application of story and how that can maybe even solve some problems or even preclude some issues in a conversation. Storytelling is extremely important. It's one of the things I really focus on with my sales clients is that quite often we're programmed to share what our products will do from our own perspective. We're telling them all about the great things that our product is going to do, plus make the kitchen shink, sink shine. Um, and that gets lost on most people receiving the message. Hmm. So instead, uh, when I respond to objections or uh, do my presentation, I, I tend to tell a story from somebody else's point of view. Uh, I rely on my experiences to tell stories. Hmm. So when talking about what you do, Talk about what you did to serve another customer and the results. Bring up the fact that, you know, uh, I had a customer, again, a little bit like feel like feel felt found, but with a little bit more depth to it, mm -hmm. that you are able to recall somebody who perhaps had a similar circumstance. Um, I was working with a, a life insurance agent the other day, and he's fairly new to the business, but one of the things I suggested to him was to go on a call where a check is being delivered hmm. after somebody had passed away. That's good. I said that story is that story is super powerful. Go on that. Yeah. Go on that. You don't have to be the sell, seller of the insurance. Just go on that, hmm. and you are going to see firsthand the impact that your product has made on somebody's life and legacy. Hmm. And uh, I remember I was in shirts a long time ago, but I remember do, going on that trip. And it was life altering for me when I saw that mm. family who lost their primary breadwinner, lost, uh, mm. spent a lot of money on hospital bills. And the fact that we were able to make sure that the house was paid off, the cars were paid off, there's no more consumer debt, and that there was legacy money left for the children that were eight, nine, 10 years old to mm. go to college. Uh, uh, I still get emotional about it. It's a, yeah. it's a real powerful moment when you put yourself in there. And that's a story that as an insurance agent, you want to be able to share with others that, that this is, this is the consequences of doing something mm. and then asking that customer. So if that person had not chosen to make that purchase at that time, what do you think the alternative consequence would have been? Yeah. And that's good. really have them own that and, and get that piece. So for me, storytelling is, is huge, no matter what you're selling. You're telling about how you've made an impact to other people's lives, to their business, uh, especially in B2B, to how you've uh, created a new opportunities for people. 
those stories resonate a lot more than me just saying, hey, you know what? We sold life insurance to someone, and because of that, the family was taken care of. Yeah, yeah. That's not, that's not much of a story. That's not much right. of, a, uh, of an emotional consequence to think about. So, yeah. again, people hear the logic, but they buy on the emotion. And so true. My, and my only rule for telling stories is it must be true. Yeah. People yeah. will see through the 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 fake stories you'll you'll just you'll sound hollow so put yourself in a position to get some real stories that you can share with customers and you will make an impact that's really really good there's some more homework for the leadership that's on the call today <laughs> on the show today um because so often what passes for a case study if it can fit, listen if it can fit on one page you're doing it wrong in my opinion okay yeah. they, they were doing x numbers and blah 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 we did these things abc blah 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 and here's the new numbers blah 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 with some nice charts, graphs, make it pretty. To my mind, that is not a case study because you're not telling any of the human story behind it. And I don't care if it's a SaaS solution and you sold it to a NASDAQ company. <laughs> you know, it's still there. There were human beings that were affected and with whom you interacted to get that deal to close. And I want to know what that story is, right? If you're selling to me, I want to know that some other folk were in a similar situation, like you said. And, and I love how you're getting there first with your that whole feel felt found. Old school is you wait for an objection, and you're like, yeah, I understand how you 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 know, I understand how you feel. Others have felt that way too. But you know what they found is, and that can be good. But how much better if you got there first, right? And you already kind of mm -hmm. allayed some of the fears you know they're going to have with really effective storytelling. It almost makes me think that just the, the even the art of storytelling could be a good skill to work on with your sales team. Would you agree? Absolutely. Uh, that is, uh, as a coach uh, with Southwestern Consulting, that is a major focus for us when we look at presentation and help m making sure people understand that that is the crux of making that connection with a customer that's ready to make a buying decision. Hmm. Well, we've blown through our half hour together, <laughs> Paul, and you still have one more key, and we had the bonus section we were going to share. Uh, and we also would have some Q&A. So for those of us on the live show, uh, if you can stick around, we're going to hit that seventh key and we'll leave some time for your questions and a little bonus section that we have. So what's the seventh skill? All right. Now, most people say, OK, close it. That must be the seventh skill. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe it is. Uh, technically, you're right. But what I think is more important is getting referrals and making sure that you are following through on the sales pr process. The sales process, if you don't have a referral component in, the, in it, you are missing out on a lot of business. So when a customer says yes, uh, they are making an emotional choice. They have not only believed into the logic of what they're doing, but they believe that this is going to be the best thing to do for their business, for their family, for whomever's making that purchase. Through stories you've already connected to the heart, and they feel right about the decision they are making. So now is the time to ask for referrals right then and there, not at hmm. product delivery, but at the point where they are making that decision. Hmm. So the first step is to let them know you value them. Uh, hey, thank you, Jeff. I know the conversation that you have uh, with with us will be of value. Uh, ask them why. Why, why, why. why did they choose to do business with you? Why did they choose to business today? Why did they choose to do business with your company? Hmm. And let them tell you. I know there are lots of others out there attempting to connect with you. Can you share with me some feedback? What did I say today that made sense to you to, to explore this further, to, to move forward? And listen to what they say. They will say a lot of different things, but they'll tell you exactly why they wanted to do business with you, how you made them feel. And it's very easy at that point just to say, look, I wish I had 100 customers like you. Mm -hmm. It's great to hear. I love getting the feedback. Who else do you know that I should reach out to that you would like to have that same type of feeling that you have today? Again, connect it back to the feeling. And yeah. then if they need memory joggers, uh, for instance, uh, it could be a colleague, a customer, even a vendor. You know, well, who, Which of your vendors have been struggling with this type of solution? Which of your colleagues from maybe other companies have been struggling with this type of thing? Hmm. Who do you know? that you think would find this invaluable, just like you have. That is the key to getting referrals, is by really uh, asking them to tell you what their why was for doing business with you. 
Because at that point, they have no reason not to share that message with others. That's really good stuff. So um, let's jump into some Q&A. So one question that is coming from the, uh, the group today is um, right on that very point. So if, if I'm in the middle of wrapping up a deal, I want to tie that down. Um, I can understand. I'm a little leery, you know, of jumping over to referrals at that point. I kind of want to wait for fulfillment or delivery or what have you and then do that. Um, are there – can you see – you know, what, what would you say to that? What would you say to that, that, that – uh, you know, that concern that right then I'm, I'm in that moment with that one person, but now I'm talking about referrals. Are there risks there? And if so, what are they and how do I mitigate those? Uh, first of all, my mindset is there are no risks there. They have made a, a choice to work with you. And that is a choice that they have taken into high consideration. They could have chosen anybody else, mm. but they chose to work with you. And if you have done your jo job correctly in presenting the benefits, presenting the time frame for rollout, for presenting how you're going to check check in with them, that's all part of the closing. How you're going to check in with them throughout the process until everything is fulfilled. Hmm. They have no reason not to consider that, hey, you know what, this is a great choice and this guy is solid. That's why they chose to buy from you. Mm -hmm. it, it's the perfect time to ask for referrals. Uh, you're not going to lose the sale. Somebody's not going to rip up the contract right in front of you. Say, oh, you asked me for referrals, get lost. Yeah. That's not going to happen. Okay. Uh, the thing that you want to make sure of is that you don't really pressure people for referrals. Mm -hmm. That you just say, hey, who else do you want? Who, who else do you know that you would like to have that same feeling that you have with working with me? Mm hmm. That's the, the way emotional you're saying that connection. up, it almost sounds like it could be the opposite because you're showing that confidence and that concern, um, that conviction that what you're doing is a value. I, I now you've got me almost on the opposite team, right? <laughs> well, I wasn't on either team, I'm kidding, but I think that's really strong. And it does again, confidence is really killer there, and that's what that conveys. Um, some other feedback from the group here this is more of a comment, but I'd like to get you to sound off on it. I have a, a marketing expert, Heather. Uh, who mentions how, and she's in the marketing side of it, how it, it's a frustration on the marketing side when they're providing everything, they're writing you know, the sales copy and the e-blast, and they're doing all this masterful work of scripting, and yet the sales team doesn't seem to really take it, make it their own, and seek to embody it. And as she calls it, adding that extra flair to it, um, mm -hmm. and they're just re leaning on marketing. W would you resonate with that, and what do you think some of maybe the organizational issues are there that would need to be solved? 100% that resonates. And that is where le sales leadership and marketing leadership need to uh, join forces and have a united front. And too often they are dichotomous. There's a lot of anger and bitterness. Uh, I was recently asked that question actually, is which is harder, sales or marketing? Hmm. And I've been in sales my entire life and I'm gonna say marketing is actually uh, harder than sales, because this is the thing, and this is what I find from salespeople that frustrates me, is somebody coming up to me and saying, Paul, the, the stuff marketing is doing is terrible. Why do you say that? Well, because because I'm not getting any qualified leads. All I'm getting is a bunch of uh, people that I that, that, that aren't, aren't the best possible client for us. Mm. And I'm just there telling them, shut up. They made the phone <laughs> ring. It's yeah. up to you to figure out and qualify the people. They, hmm. they use a broad net to get the phones to ring. It's hmm. up to you to narrow it down. And if you can't make that client, that person into a client, what you can do is get referrals from them. What you can do is point them to another resource that is going to give them more of what they're looking for to establish that relationship. There's a lot of things you can do with those clients that aren't perfect for you. Marketing is not in charge of giving you perfect people because if they were, we wouldn't need sales people. Hmm. They are there to make the phone rings and to get you opportunities. They're hmm. not gonna be the best opportunities all of the time, but you are there to make it, take those lemons and turn them into lemonade. That's your job as a salesperson. Hmm. Sounds like maybe the, the, uh, the sales leaders and managers should also formulate or uh, build a really great relationship with the marketing team if it doesn't exist already. I mean, after all, you know, marketing is where you are going to find really great copywriters in most organizations. Mm -hmm. They can help get some great scripting started, um, and then hopefully the leaders can coach the uh, the individuals to own that and make it their own. Maybe with your help, Paul. So, uh, so I would love so, to help them. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. So let me see if there's other questions. Um, yeah, I mean, there's there's. Uh, 
the thing about scripts keeping out there's a lot of just a lot of resonating comments on here knowing your product listening to the customer having those those uh open-ended questions to get engagement so great great uh, session today paul thanks for adding value to our audience today the way that you have um if folks want to reach out to you directly how do they uh do they best go about that uh best way is you can call me or go to uh uh, southwesterncoaching.com and at southwesterncoaching.com just click on coaches and you can find my link uh, and my email address is pledesma p-l-e-d-e-s-m-a at southwesterncoaching.com and there's one thing I'd like to add uh, for any the next 10 people that connect with me or send me a note on LinkedIn uh, be happy to send you a copy of this wonderful book called Redu Redefining Possible written by Dustin Hillis and Ron Alford uh, it's all about mindset and getting your confidence, which was, I, I think, a major theme of what we talked about. So 10 people, random drawing, I'll send you a copy of this book. Just make sure to uh, send me your mailing address and, or, or best way to contact you so I can get that book to you. Okay, so you heard it here. So uh, they should mention that they heard you on Evolved Sales Live. So yep. the next 10 of you that connect with Paul from Evolve Sales Live, you got a free book coming your way in the mail. That's a great offer, Paul. Thanks so much for that. Thanks so much to our audience for being here today for another great, fantastic, in fact, episode of Evolve Sales Live. And with that, we'll sign off. Have a great rest of your evening, everybody. Thank you all.